feel like they said before Muhammad Ali walked in, the champ is here. The champ is here. The champ is here. We have the Evangelical Christian School basketball team. Amen. Women's basketball team who are on their way to the state championship. Come on, we can do better than that. Praise God. And we have the coach of the year. Coach Dwayne Donnell. Proud member of the Friendship Church who's with us. Come on up, girls. Come on up. Amen. We'll turn it into the hands of, of Coach to introduce them. Amen. Y'all, this group plays some basketball. I mean, from the tip off to the end, buzzer. They play the game like it's supposed to be played, and we're so glad for them. Coach. Yes, sir. Thank you again. I uh, appreciate you. This is definitely the Evangelical Christian School girls basketball team headed to Lakeland on Thursday morning to bring back. Right Come over here, Zai. Come over here, Zai. Stand right here. Come here, Maddie. Stand right there. But don't leave some room in the middle because we're going to bring home that third one that's going to stick right there on Thursday. So you stay <laughs> right like that. We got one more to get. Thursday evening, you broke the record by $3,000 for our attendance for the last game. They hadn't seen one like that since in eight years. So thank you for coming out and watching them do what they did to the last game, right? So eventually next time, I hope we're gonna up that again because I don't think they really know what this is at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, but we about to show them what's happened over here because we gonna come over there with them, right, Maddie? We're gonna come over there and we're gonna leave. I have all of my coaches. I have their mamas and daddies. You see, we roll, this is how we roll. I love my parents. And we going up there to give them the business, Pastor. I'm telling you. You seen us, and you know what we going to do. We, we, we plan to come back. These girls playing tremendous basketball right now. And I am excited, but I can't. I wish Tuesday was tomorrow. So we go ahead and get it over with. When is the game? What time? Location? The game is at Lakeland, Florida at the RP Funding Center. We play at 5 o'clock p.m. against University Christian out of Jacksonville. We will leave here on Tuesday after parade at 9 o'clock, heading that way. I'm sure everybody's busy, but we'll see you. We'll give you two chances to see us. We'll see you at 5 o'clock on Tuesday. But if you can't make Tuesday, surely be there 530 on Thursday, because we're going to be there, all right? 530 Thursday, Lakeland at the RP Funding Center. Come on, give them another praise offering. Thank you, ladies. You may be seated. Bring home the hardware. Amen. Amen.
you know he's worthy? I said he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. He woke you up this morning, started you on your way. I know about myself because I know that many times I should have been cut off, but God had mercy on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God.
I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days. And some sleepless nights. But when I look around, and I think things over. days outweigh my bad days so I I won't complain sometimes the clouds hang low I can hardly see about it. Just think about it. Think about it and go and tell him thank you for bringing me over. Thank you for keeping me. 
Hallelujah. Let the church say amen. Praise God for the move of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you have to let God have his way. Throw his weight around the building a little bit. And we praise God for him. I want to invite your intellect and summon your senses to the book of Acts. <clears throat> the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles for the birthing of the church. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 4. Praise his holy name. Acts chapter 4. It is there that the Holy Ghost is highlighted for us. Verses of scripture beginning at verse 13. <clears throat> when you have it, say, I've got it. If not, say, please wait. You'd be so kind, standing in the presence of God. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, and your Bible should read, And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, that they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, 
by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has now become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. <clears throat> now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. Verse 18 says, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had just been done. For the man was over 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. I want to use for a subject, there ain't no stopping us now. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, hey neighbor, ain't no stopping us now. Touch your other neighbor and say, we on the move. <laughs> Those of you from the 70s get that. I know it's not grammatically correct, but ain't no stopping us now. Let me announce again at the onset of this introduction, one simple notion that serves both as an introdu uh, introduction and also a thesis for this sermon. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, that you cannot keep a person down who refuses to stay down. Might I suggest to you that is one thing to be knocked down, but the difference is you won't stay down. <clears throat> I'm sure there are already some witnesses in this room who will testify. It's not that I haven't been knocked down, but God keeps giving me the strength and the energy and the wherewithal. I feel like preaching already and the anointing and the power not to stay down. And every time something or somebody knocks you down, God keeps raising you back up. And you have discovered that life is not about how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you manage to get yourself back up. Might I suggest to you that that is the real doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's not that Jesus wasn't knocked down by the brutality of the crucifixion by his enemies. The problem was he wouldn't stay down. On the third day, he got back up from the grave. Such is this notion discovered in Acts chapter 4, where there is a problem between the current religious system and this new order that Jesus has established that he has now called the ecclesia or the church. Jesus Christ wasn't just affecting the world, ladies and gentlemen. But Jesus Christ was affecting religion. Since Jesus was the final sacrifice for sin, the fulfillment of the payment of the penalty for death, then there was no more sacrifice to be made after him. Therefore, all of the aspects of the bit of the historical temple were no longer needed. The sacrificial system, which was governed and facilitated by the religious order which included sacrifices for atonement, 
observances of feast and rituals of obedience were no longer required after the death and resurrection of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the priest, after the death and resurrection of Christ resulting in the birth of the church, the priest really had no presence in the New Testament because there was nothing left to sacrifice. There was no more religious order to govern and sacrificial system to facilitate by the priest. At the resurrection of Jesus, the duties of the priest were no longer required because there was no longer a person that was needed to stand in the gap between man and God and serve as a conduit or intercessor for the atonement of the people. After Jesus Christ, there is no need to come into a private closet and tell clergy and priest our intimate business and our embarrassing secrets. We can go to God for ourselves. As a matter of fact, Bishop, a sign of your spiritual maturity, ladies and gentlemen, is not how much you call on your pastor. It's how much you call on God. After Jesus Christ, the pastor is called to preach and teach the word, not to atone for your sins. And so now you get your preaching and teaching from your pastor, but you make all of your confession to God. I wish I had about two or three people who can testify that I tell all of my stuff to God because he's the only one who can do anything about it anyway. You come to church to get the word, but you run to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. There is no dispensation of mercy and atonement from the priest to the people because Jesus has now made atonement once and for all for all mankind. And the current system in the book of Acts comes now against Peter and John. As a matter of fact, chapter 3 opens up with the first post-Pentecostal miracle. That being a crippled man who laid at the gate called Beautiful. At this gate, ladies and gentlemen, the text is explicit and vivid to tell us that he is lame. And not only is he lame, he is lame from his birth. He's over 40 years old and he has never walked in his life. He is lame from his birth. Peter and John go up to the temple at the gate called Beautiful at the hour of prayer. They notice this man laying at the gate and said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The text says he responded by leaping up and stood and began to walk and enter the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Y'all, he rises up from his lame condition, which was prenatal, and his movement now becomes multifaceted. Y'all, he jumps up, he stood up for a moment, he began to walk, and as he walked, he kept jumping up until he was leaping and praising God. Peter and John just said unto him, rise. The text says he leaped, which means when God gave him the use of his legs for the first time in his life, that he refused to stand still. He went from standing to walking to jumping, and Peter and John never say anything else to this man. I need to tell somebody in here this morning who's waiting for something spectacular to happen in your life. Don't miss the miracle looking for a miracle you've already got because you already have grounds to give God the glory. Y'all, this man ends up praising God, which means his legs were a prenatal gift that would result in praising God, which means his legs are not the miracle, he is the miracle. Mm. I don't know about you, but every now and then I give God the glory because I'm still together. Can anybody testify I'm still holding it together? Tell your neighbor, he's still holding me together. He's still keeping me together after all I've been through. I'm still in my right mind. Y'all missed it. Don't get it twisted. I didn't say I wasn't a little crazy. I said I'm still in my right mind. I still have the activity of my limbs and God has been keeping me the whole time. Where are my 50, 60 plus people in the house? I need about 20 y'all. I'll make 21 who can testify God's still keeping me together. Still putting food on my table, clothes on my back. Still putting joy in my heart after all I've been through. Y'all help me preach and feel like it and tell your neighbor, say neighbor, you don't even know my story after all 
that I've been through. I should have fallen apart. I should have broken up by now. But is there anybody that can wave a hand and say what came against me didn't break me? <laughs> because I told the devil, you can't take my soul. And he's still holding it together after this miracle, the aftermath of this miracle, Peter and John now are arrested and they spend one night in jail. But the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that the charges are not clear at the time of the arrest. They are in jail with no clear charges that have been given to them. And when you read chapter 4, verse 2, it says they apprehended Peter and John because they were grieved at their preaching of the resurrection of Jesus. Can I walk y'all through this text? By the time we get to chapter 4 and verse 10, when they interrogated Peter and John, the question was, by what authority do you have to give this crippled man the ability to walk? You will notice, church, that the charges are not clear because the interrogation and the incarceration were for two separate reasons. They incarcerated them for what they preached, but they interrogated them for what they performed. And we're not clear because one reason really doesn't associate with the other. They are incarcerated for what they preached, but now they are interrogated for what they perform. And Peter and John want to know, listen, are y'all mad at what we said or are you mad at what we did? We are unclear on why you're arresting us because your interrogation and our incarceration keep changing. You're mad at what we said, but you are interrogating us on what authority we're operating under because you obviously see that we have authority. Your problem is the authority you see that came from what you heard that we did did not come by your permission. We preached and we performed without your permission. So ladies and gentlemen, there's some confusion here because the confusion is, are you mad at the power of God or the fact that we didn't ask you permission to preach and perform in the power of God? And if he's mad at the preaching of Jesus as the Christ, it's more clear because that means that he's mad at the resilience of the person of Christ. Y'all say person of Christ. Because now if he's resurrected, that means that Jesus got up from the grave. But if he's mad by the authority by which they operate in, it's more clear. Because on one hand, he's wrestling with the person of Christ. But on the other hand, he's wrestling with the power of Christ. And so they are arrested because of the person of Christ. But they're now questioned about the power of Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, here is the real issue. If in his person he was dead and is back. And in his power, he's still doing what he did before he died. Peter and John understand why he's mad. Because just less than two months ago, you killed him. You put him on a cross. You put nails in his hands and his feet. You put a crown of thorns on his head. And now two months later, after you did everything to stop this Jesus Christ, his person is back. His power is back. And the reason that you're mad is all of that says is if he's back, that means you failed. If this crippled man, come here class, if this crippled man rose in the name of Jesus, that means Jesus is back. If we told him in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, and not only did he walk, he leaped and praised God, it means that Jesus is back. Y'all ain't feeling me. If this man got up from his lame legs in the name of Jesus, it means that Jesus got up first. And anybody who calls on that name gets up because he got up. That means that they weren't necessarily being attacked, y'all, because they were succeeding. Catch this church. But the problem now is their success pointed out his failure. And sometimes in life, people won't attack you because you are a failure. People attack you because you are a success. It's, that, it's just that your continued success points out their failure in trying to stop you. 
Lord, help me preach this morning. And the problem some people have with you even right now is they were sleeping on your ability to bounce back from the setback that you were set up with. Y'all, the enemy can't stand the fact that God keeps raising you up and every time he tries to hold you down, here you come again. There's a name for that, y'all. There's a term for that. That's called bounce back power. Would you high five your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got bounce back power. Every time something happens to set me back up and stop me, here I come again. Anybody here got bounce back power? If you got the Holy Ghost in you, you got the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. That's why you keep bouncing back. That's why you keep coming back. That's why you won't give up. And here's the problem. If the name is still being called and the power is still working, that means Jesus has to be back from the grave. It means that death couldn't hold him. It means he succeeded and they failed. They tried to sabotage him and now have to look up in chapter four and say, here he come again. And ladies and gentlemen, your enemies and haters can't stand the fact that you just keep coming again and again. When you walk back into work with all your anointing and your favor and blessing, here she come again. When you walk in the community with all that you've been through and still got a swag in your step and a smile here he come again as a matter of fact let's not get it twisted somebody in church looked at you this morning here she go again shouting again praising God again looking good again can anybody testify yeah here I come again and I'm gonna keep coming in the name Look over and tell your neighbor, I'm here in the name of Jesus. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Don't hate me because I'm anointed. Don't hate me because he kept me. I'm here in the name of Jesus. Tell your neighbor, I ain't here for you, baby. I, I, I'm here for Jesus. Jesus is the one. They hung high and stretched wide. Jesus is the one that went to Calvary on Friday, hung from the sixth to the ninth hour. Jesus is the one that stayed in the grave for the better part of three days. Jesus is the one that got up on Sunday morning with all power in their hand. Jesus is the one who wakes me up in the morning. Jesus is the one who puts clothes on my back. Jesus is the one. Tell your neighbor, I love you, but I worship Jesus. I need some old school saints who can testify. There's power in that name. Oh, there's power in that name. I feel something when I call the name Jesus. Matter of fact, if you say the name Jesus too much, I'm going to start running and dancing. Because when I think mm, about the goodness of God and all that he's done for me, my soul. Somebody say, in the name. Might I suggest to you that in this thing called life, and we're going to get there this morning. I got some shrimp and grits waiting on me. <laughs> Tell them, baby. I was up till five o'clock in the morning, too. Somebody say, preach, black boy. Uh, might, might I suggest to you Uh, uh, might I suggest to you in case you didn't know it in life you will get knocked down Psalm 37 says the steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord though he fall not if he fall not should he fall not might he fall though he fall watch this he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord uphold him with his hand the difference in the person who has the power of Christ residing on the inside of them is we get knocked down but we sure don't stay down y'all ain't feeling me we fall down but we get back up 
find somebody to look at and tell them, don't stay down. Don't stay down. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't stay down. Don't stay depressed. Don't stay defeated. Don't stay discouraged. Don't stay dispirited. Don't stay beat. Don't stay broken. Whatever you do, don't stay down. Somebody shout and holler back at your boy and say, I won't stay down. The same Holy Spirit that got Jesus up from the dead is the same you received when you confess Jesus as your Savior and now resides and presides on the inside of you. That means you can't be stopped. Peter and John said in chapter 3, come here class, y'all won't come to Sunday school, I got to bring you. John said in chapter 3, in the name of Jesus, rise. <laughs> The problem the enemy has with you is the same problem he had with Jesus. You just won't stay down. Oh, he thought he had you for five chapters. When you went through that season in your life, anybody here remember that season? Where you look so defeated and dispirited, but now you in chapter four. And you can look back now and say no weapon form against me shall prosper. Watch what the enemy does, y'all. He knocks you down. He keeps attacking you because the fact that you're up means they failed. Let me push this here. The enemy hates to see you coming because he has to look at his own failure. I ain't got nobody here that's ever had no enemies. His weapons didn't work. His words didn't work. His ways didn't work. His lies didn't work. His rumors didn't work. His plots didn't work. His plans didn't work. His politics didn't work. His hidden agendas didn't work. Like Peter and John, you're still witnessing and performing in the name of Jesus. Y'all, there's some insights to this passage that gives us revelation on the strategy of the enemy's attack. Y'all want to hear the strategy of the enemy's attack? Because they're under attack. <laughs> The first thing the enemy tries to do, catch this, is to diminish your credibility. Y'all, he has to answer for their apparent success and his apparent failure. And the first tactic is not being noticed as a failure by attacking Jesus to diminish their credibility. His problem is while they're trying to diminish their credibility, Watch what happens in the text. They have a credible witness. They're attacking their credibility. Are y'all in your Bible? In the courtroom comes a man who was lame from his birth. He's now over 40 years old. He's never been on his feet and they know it. And now he's walking around town in the name of Jesus. And so they can craft now explanations for Peter and John. But what they cannot explain is this man who was once lame, now walking around town. Guess this church, Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead is still walking around. People who receive miracles, signs and wonders from Jesus are still walking around. But it's been over two months since the death of Jesus and there have been no miracles by Jesus. Meaning that for two months the enemy thought he destroyed the credibility of Jesus because there's been no miracles and there's been no witnesses. But now in the courtroom is a fresh credible witness. I wish I had somebody in friendship who can testify I'm a fresh witness. I'm the one who can say because of his mercies. I'm not consumed. They are new every morning. I don't have to keep telling the same old stale testimony that I had 20 years ago. Is there anybody here with a fresh testimony as a fresh witness that I serve a God who just did a miracle in my life? Anybody here have a fresh testimony of the goodness of God? Not only did he wake me up in 1968, he keeps on awakening me. As a fact, he woke me up this morning. That's my fresh testimony that I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and up into his courts with praise because God did a miracle with me this morning. 
Oh, I wish I had a church. Reach over and grab your hand and touch them real good. Your neighbor says, say, neighbor, I just want you to know how it feels to hold the hand of a miracle. Some of y'all ain't do it. Cup your neighbor one more time and say, neighbor, I just need you to know how it feels to hold the hand of a survivor. Do I have any survivors in the house? As a fresh witness of the goodness of God, a fresh witness of the glory of God, I I am a witness that God is able. I am a witness that God is good and he's good all the time and all the time. I am a witness that I once was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That's why they hate me because I'm a witness of the glory of God. Everybody knew. <laughs> Told you I was black last week. Let me try it like this. Everybody knew. The man couldn't walk his whole life. And other credible witness heard Peter and John say in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Watch what God does. God gives them what they needed most when they're being interrogated and tried. He gave them somebody to point to their credibility. Let me try it like this. Y'all ain't feeling me. Hey, y'all, this just happened. Just seven chapters and two months ago, they arrested Jesus and finally led him to Pontius Pilate's headquarters. In that brief conversation, Jesus confesses that he is the king. To diminish the credibility of Jesus and to prove that he is a fraud and not the king, they put a fraudulent crown on his head made of thorns. They inscribed a piece of wood on the cross that fraudulently read King of the Jews. By the time we get to the sixth hour on the cross, the credibility of Jesus has been diminished by the Jews and Romans. When the ninth hour comes, Jesus atones for the sins behind the veil of darkness where nobody else could see except one person with a fresh witness. And behind the veil of darkness, there was a centurion soldier as a witness that says surely this man was a son of God is there anybody that can testify that God will always have a witness <laughs> we're now in verse 13 come here church it says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John so we're clear <clears throat> they arrested Peter and John <laughs> kept them in jail one night. The next day, there's the interrogation. At the interrogation, in verse eight, verse eight, Lord have mercy, Peter is filled with the Holy Ghost and says this, you ask me about helping this crippled man. Let it be known that Jesus, who you killed, is raised from the dead. And because of that, this man is healed. And there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. Verse 13 says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, catch this church, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they marveled at unlearned and ignorant men. This is why we're still unclear. One action is that they saw. The next action is they perceived. Y'all, they saw, they saw them be bold, but looked at them and said, but they don't look like they smart. <laughs> they heard them speak, y'all, and tried to figure out that the verbal gift and the physical package don't look like they belong together and they marveled at how they were intelligent and ignorant at the same time. Lean in here, church. Y'all, people don't know anything about you till you open your mouth. Come here, child of God. And sometimes people have to figure out that you may be different than how you look because you can't judge a... 
a book by its cover. And you can't assume that I'm ignorant just because I look ignorant to you. They saw, then they perceived. They looked at the exterior, but they heard the interior. And they made the mistake of judging them on what they were aware of on the outside. But when they actually sat down and had a conversation with them, they perceived and marveled. Y'all be careful of writing people off on something you heard about them. Lord have mercy. I need to talk so the gossiping people can hear this. If you ever had a lie told about you, you need to close your mouth when you hear something, I know it's quiet, when you hear something about somebody else. When you've ever had rumors spread on you, you ought to close your mouth isn't it interesting how people can believe something about you but never actually sat down, had a cup of coffee with you, never took you to lunch, never had a conversation. They just believe something somebody else said. The devil is a lie. If you want to know something about me, come to the horse and I'll, I'll tell you what's on my mind. Do I have about 15 people that say you ain't got to hear no rumor. You ain't got to listen to nobody. Step to me, but come to me right because I'm on the north side of Detroit. Don't step to me sideways. But if you come to me right, I'll tell you what's what. Hold on because I didn't got happy here. Don't bring no gossip to Jared Scott Parker. I don't want to hear nothing about nobody else. Do you know why? I know how it feels. talking about people I'm trying to get here I know we got some visitors in the house and I'm talking to you too quit talking about people quit spreading people business that you don't even know I just done got to the age do I have any people in here who can testify I don't want no more drama don't bring me no messy petty foolishness I just want to come to church, have church, write my sermon, write my Bible study, teach Bible, get in my convertible, drop my top, get Lily on the phone, go back to my house, watch my TV, eat my food, and drink my Coke Zero. Do I have about 10 people who can testify? I just want to mind my own business. Stop gossiping. Don't bring me nothing because if you bring it to me, that means you think I'm the one who receives it. I heard they said, don't you know what's going on? That means you ain't got a life. Look at somebody, not in the eye, but just say, get a life. I'm too busy to be worried about you. Why are you worried about me? I need some hood people. Tell your neighbor, get some business. Get you some business. I heard some of y'all just too old for that. I heard what's going on down there at Friendship. You ain't got to hear nothing. It's 2030 Palm Avenue. My email is rev.jarrodparker at yahoo.com. I'll tell you what's going on at Friendship. What you don't want to hear is God is blessing us. There's anointing in the building. People are being saved. People are being healed. People are being delivered. We having some church up in there, up in there. Tell your neighbor, go run, tell that. And keep my name.
Y'all lean in. I didn't went too far, River. I feel run DMC. Homeboy, you talk to me. You never shut up. Ah, they couldn't put the two together. That word marveled. Y'all say marveled. marveled. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and post it on Facebook. Tell, tell them pastor snapping this morning. Come on. Bring them on in. We're going to tell it all anyway. Might well tell pastor preaching this morning. Tell that. It means to wonder. Y'all say wonder. It means to admire. To see them sitting there and hear them speak was something different. But what did they hear, y'all, that made them admire? I'm getting to it here. <clears throat> Peter accused them of killing Jesus, <laughs> announced that he's risen, and told them they wouldn't be saved without him. Which means they didn't admire his words, they admired his boldness. This man is on trial for his life, y'all, and he won't shut up. They're trying to discredit them by protecting, ig projecting ignorance onto intelligent people and make them inferior so that they can be superior to Peter and John. Y'all missed that one. Whew. Let me unpack it like this. Sometimes in life, people can project something onto you that's not really you to make themselves look superior and feel comfortable with you. And to discredit them, they projected something onto them that was not the reality. But watch how God fixes it. Mm. Y'all ready for this? Lean in, church. Sometimes your public adversaries are actually your secret admirers. Come here. They accuse him to be accepted with the mainstream group, but they really admire them on the low low. And they can't express it because if they express it, they themselves become inferior. <laughs> Some people who attack you actually admire you. Oh, come here, y'all. Some people who talk about you actually admire you. And watch what happens. In the interrogation room, God gives them credibility when the goal is to diminish it. Because if Peter and John succeed, they fail. And watch the boldness of Peter. Peter never apologized to insecure people who are too insecure to admit publicly that they really admire his boldness. Notice that it was his boldness, not his arrogance. Because Peter was not arrogant, they're just confused. Peter knew who he was. They didn't know who they were. When you know who you are in the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, you don't go around apologizing to everybody, especially to people who know who they are. Can anybody testify? I know who I am. And I know whose I am. The text says they marveled. Y'all say marvel. The admiration was in secret so that they could keep a seat with all of the interrogators. But they really secretly wanted to listen to Peter. And they tried, y'all, to diminish their credibility. To bring them on a level that they could handle. Because the only way that they could handle Peter was to project on him to be ignorant and unlearned. Some of you in this place today have learned to stop trying to please people who are trying to bring you down to their level. They try to diminish their credibility, but secondly, the enemy also won't acknowledge your positive change. Catch this, church. They're talking to Peter and John, and Peter's big mouth. Peter always had a big mouth. He's always the one speaking up. But sometimes God can use what you had in your unsaved life. Take it and sanctify it. And use it, Lord have mercy, in your saved life. Y'all, the pre-Jesus Peter won't shut up. The post-Jesus Peter keep talking about the one he won't shut up. The very thing they arrested him for is the very thing he's still saying in the interrogation. Peter says that a crippled man was raised in the name of Jesus and the man, Lord have mercy, is standing right there. 
That means that the man who was healed yesterday showed up to court the next day just to be evidence on behalf of the defendants. Y'all, he doesn't say anything. Lord, hold your boy through here. He doesn't say anything. He just stood there. 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 He doesn't say anything because he just stood there. Y'all slow. The reason he stood there and doesn't say anything is because he doesn't have to say anything. He is a living testimony of the goodness of God. So when he walks into a room, his testimony... His testimony walks in the room with him. That's why the Lord put you through something that everybody in the community knew, all your family knew, all your friends knew, is because he knew when he brought you out of it that you would give God the glory without verbal confrontation. You ain't got to say nothing but thank you, Jesus. Verse 14 says that the interrogators did not say a word about this man standing there who was lying crippled just yesterday. Y'all, verse 15 and 16 says, they motion hmm, and call an impromptu meeting and it is a closed door meeting <laughs> because they have no public answer so they have to have a private deliberation. Y'all, that's when you know you're having an impact. When people who can't stop your public impact keep having to have private deliberations about you and they admit in the closed door meeting that the man standing there is actually a miracle in the courtroom. They never admitted it in open, but y'all behind closed doors, they acknowledge in private what they wouldn't say in public. That means that they didn't want it to be known that they actually like what Peter, Lord have mercy, and John did. They will say it privately, y'all ain't feeling me, but not publicly. You've got some people in your life who love you in private. These are scary people, but they won't show it in public. The pressure of the public is more scary than the praise in private. And here's the problem, y'all. Whether it was in the name of Jesus or not, whatever name they used, they actually did some good for the community. A man has received positive change. He's standing right there and they cannot publicly acknowledge the positive changes. Y'all, I got a question. I'm a little bit slow. But I got a question in the text, y'all. Hey, y'all. Acts was written by Luke, right? Acts is written by Luke, which is an addendum and an addition to his own gospel, which is the gospel of Luke, right? Acts chapter four says they have a closed door private meeting. My question is, hey deacons, if it was a closed door, impromptu private meeting, how did Luke get the minutes of the meeting? <laughs> Lean in here, child of God. Luke is not a member of the Sanhedrin Council. He's just a physician. He's working to get the gospel out. How does he get the minutes? Can I peruse an idea for y'all? And we're getting ready to get out of here. Lily look good today. Here's what happened. They called a secret meeting against God's men. But they couldn't call a secret meeting against God. Y'all missed it. God must have had somebody in the secret meeting that they didn't know. They like being in Fort Myers. You better be careful who you talking to cause you don't know who connected. I've been here 10 months and I know that. 
they must have had somebody in the secret meeting who was on God's side. If that's the case, that means when they met in secret, God had a snitch. <laughs> Y'all listen to this. God got snitches. Reach over and tell your neighbor, God got snitches. Tell somebody else, God got snitches. If you want to allow me in the meeting, God got somebody on the other side of the meeting. So when you're meeting on me, you're really meeting on God. God has some secret informants. God got some rats. God got some whistleblowers. God got some tattle tales. He doesn't need them to wear wires or make secret recordings. He just touches their heart towards your purpose. Y'all, God has somebody working for Peter in secret. And here's what I love about God. I'm almost through. All things work together for the good to them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And oftentimes, ladies and gentlemen, you will never know how God worked something out in secret that benefited you publicly. Come here. Somebody had your back when you didn't know it. Somebody defended you when you didn't know it. Somebody foiled a plot in your life when you didn't know it. Somebody stood up for you when you didn't know it. God kept you, preserved you, protected you, and covered you, and kept it private. That's why I just don't praise him for what I know he's done. I praise him for what I don't know that he's done, that he kept in private. Is there anybody here that can testify? Praise God for all of his secret and private and undercover and clandestine blessings that were done in private that were not for public view. Somebody shout, God kept me in private. You had a silent partner that you never met because God got some snitches. I'm done. I'm done. It's hard work this morning. I'm done. This it. Boy, that second row right there, Reverend. That row right there. They try to diminish their credibility, downplay their positive changes, but finally, they try to depress their capabilities. Verse 15, it's a closed door meeting <laughs> just between the council. And they say in the closed door meeting that are on the minutes that Luke gets, this is a miracle and the whole city knows it. Watch what they say at church. We got to do something to stop the spread. Okay, come here. They couldn't do anything to stop the miracle. So they set out to stop the spread. That there would be no more preaching. Too many people are talking about what's going on in this little church they started. In the name of the man they thought was dead. So here's what we'll do. We'll threaten them because we can't stop what was done. We got to stop what might happen. Y'all, I'm done. But they're attacking them because they know the power of their potential. Y'all, the enemy attacks you when the enemy has a glimpse of your potential. They're behind closed doors and have already imagined what can happen that Peter and John haven't even imagined yet because they see their capabilities. So they don't attack them, they attack the ability of their gift. Isn't it strange that sometimes your enemy has more faith in your future than you do? They are working overtime to try to stop the spread of what's going on in this little church in this little community called Jerusalem because if we don't stop the spread it's going to get everywhere and this little church is going to quickly grow to 3,000 if Peter preaches one more sermon Lord have mercy that means that what the enemy is doing in your life is a compliment because he's actually acknowledging the fact that your future has capabilities because they're working hard to stop it it also means that the enemy is not attacking you for your past. He's attacking you for your future. And they're not concerned about the miracle, but they're concerned about the spread of the miracle. Matter of fact, the whole interrogation, y'all, Peter is talking about the past. They go behind closed doors and start to talk about their future. 
and when they see their future they said no we got to stop this but I got good news for y'all y'all want to hear it if you just endure the latest attack your future is going to happen because some good you've done in the past is going to catch up to your future they healed the man yesterday but a witness shows up into the court today they healed him in Acts chapter 3 and he shows up the next day which means the blessing they put on his life caught up with them the next day and when they tried to get Peter to stop talking in Jesus name Peter says these words y'all in the Bible Peter looks at them and says I can't help it he says but we can't help it because the request presumes that God has done something to be quiet about so in verse 9 they say Jesus did something in verse 20 they say we can't help but say something and I don't know about you y'all but I'm not that lady who comes across the intercom in the airport that says if you see something suspicious say something if you see something say something and here's the audacity of the text y'all they never shut up because they've come too far to stop talking about the name of Jesus. And the text says that the whole time that they were under interrogation, it says that Peter never shut up. Am I preaching to anybody who can testify that I come too far to close my mouth Amount uh, the goodness of God. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You got a big mouth everywhere else you go. But when you come to the house of prayer, you stop talking about the goodness of God. But I showed up to tell God thank you. That as much as I've been through God, that you're still keeping me. And you're still beside me. And you're still blessing me. So I got a case of the can't help it. Because every time the enemy tried to close my mouth, I had to open it up and tell God, Lord, I thank you for how far you brought me. I need about 15 people who can testify. I got to say something through here. Some of y'all been here for about an hour and 45 minutes and you ain't said nothing to God yet. Let me give you five seconds to open your mouth and give God the glory. I'll count it down for you. Five, four, three, two, one. Let everything that have breath give God the glory. Let everything that have breath give God the praise. Say yes. Say yes. Would you wave your hand and say, God, I thank you. Do this for me. Grab your neighbor by the hand. Shake it like you're going to shake it off. Would you do it for me? Y'all getting on my nerves. Shake it like you're going to shake it over. And say, neighbor, ain't no stopping us now. Do I have any friendship members who can testify? We've been to hell and back. We've had some tough days. But ain't no stopping us now. Is there anybody here that can testify? I'm going to the next level. Anybody here? I'm reaching my goal because there ain't no stopping us now. Say yeah. Say yeah. I don't care what I got to go through. I don't care what happens. I'm going to my future. Say yes. Say yes. I ain't no. I ain't no, 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 stopping me now. He died one Friday, stayed in the grave all day Saturday, but early 
Sunday morning. What happened, y'all? What happened, y'all? He got up so I can get up. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his best and only son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. There may be someone here today that desires the gift of everlasting life. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Won't you stand at this time as we extend to you an invitation to come and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can come by letter on a Christian experience or you can come as a candidate for baptism. But do come. This may be your last chance. No man knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man is going to return. But God woke you up this morning and gave you a chance, gave you an opportunity to come and establish a relationship with his Son so that you might receive the gift of everlasting life. Amen. Amen. That's what the message was all about. Come to Jesus. Come as you are. You can't change your life without Jesus Christ. Christ is that change agent. Won't you come? Will there be another? Will there be another? God woke you up this morning and inspired you to come out to his house of prayer today. If you're looking for a church home, you came to the right place. You came at the right time. All you have to do now is voluntarily accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Won't you come today? Won't you come in the name of Jesus? Amen. You may be seated. We thank God for those that came today. Amen. Amen. We're now in the hands of our ushers. When God woke you up this morning and inspired you to come out to the house of prayer to worship him in spirit and in truth, he also let you know that you should be prepared to give an offering. Amen. And he told you what to get out of your wallet, out of your purse, out of your bank account and bring and give so that this house will continue to be able to do his work. It's on us. It's on us to give. But Jesus gave his life and he's only asking us to give a little tiny offering so that this church might grow and continue to thrive in this community. Amen. You're now in the hands of the of the ushers.
Come on, let's give them another hand clap of praise. Wonderful Savior. Would you look at somebody in front of you, beside you, behind you, and tell them it's good to be alive? No, reach at somebody and tell I'm better than good. Anybody show up to praise him today? We give God all of the glory and praise and honor, for he is worthy of all of it. Amen. I need to see who I'm preaching to today. I need about 20 living testimonies who can testify I should have been dead and gone. But God let me live on. Wave your hand, holler at your boy and say, I'm alive and well. And I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Praise his holy name. God bless you. God keep you. Thank you, children. Amen for blessing us. Brings back so many memories of, of my days in the cherub choir. Amen. We ought to support our children. Is that right? Thank you, Brother Esmond, and to all of the parents and advisors and staff of our youth department. Amen. We, uh, before we segue into our Operation Andrew, <clears throat> we have some special guests here today uh, that we want to re realize, uh, that we want to recognize rather, uh, and thank them for being part of our service on today. First of all, we have the Lee County Black Historical Society is with us on Black History Month. Amen. Would you stand, please, the Lee County Black Historical Society. Let's give them a great big praise offering. Amen. Miss Shirley is going to come and introduce. Was it who, who, who do I have wrong? Amen. Everybody's pointing at her. Amen. We'll come and introduce the society to us. Good morning. Everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much, Pastor Parker, for having us join you all today. We are thrilled, we are happy to have many of our board members, some of our staff here, and we are thrilled to be a part of this dynamic service this morning. The Lee County Black History Society, our motto is illuminate the past and ignite the future. And we are so happy that you invited us today. Amen, well we're gonna help you uh, illuminate the past and ignite the future. We have a check for $1,000 on behalf of Friendship Church for your efforts uh, for you. Amen, thank you for all of your work. Amen, what a beautiful, beautiful organization you have. We look forward to being partners with you. Good to see you, man, amen. And uh, thank you for your plans going forward. We're gonna get that building up. Amen, amen. We're gonna support that effort. <clears throat> Praise God, and then we have, praise God. If you practice Operation Andrew and you did bring a guest this morning, why don't you stand and introduce your guest? Amen. Our attendants will be coming around with a microphone so you can uh, make sure that we understand clearly who your guests are. Amen. Amen. Yes, Brother Ladovi. Good morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Where am I? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Good morning. Again. <laughs> Praise God. I told God. my daughter I'm tired of standing that she need to go ahead and do this one this time, but she's shy. So, Jazz, go ahead and stand up with your friends and your family. All uh, y'all go ahead and stand up. Amen. I also have, y'all can stand up too. I have two other guests right here. And then um, people ask me when people come, do they come back? And I'm going to say yes, because I got my sister and her kids back there. And I got my friend Bree Bree back there with her family. Amen. Come on, give her a great big praise offering. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. Welcome to all of you again. I know it's hard to tell her no, but thank you for being with us this morning. Who's next? Good morning, church. Good morning. I have my nephew, Sidney Peterson, from Minnesota, and his daughter, Malia, from New York. Amen. So glad to have you with us. Amen. Minnesota, New York. Welcome to the warm weather. Amen. We praise God for you and for your being here for safe travels. Amen. Well, yes. I would like to introduce my brother from another mother. Is Reverend Larry Ford. 
We're extended family. They're German, Irish, we are African, Native American. We lived in four neighborhoods together. His children call me daddy. My children call him daddy. He's a Grammy gospel singer. He's been to this church to sing before. And he's talking to the pastor now because he wanted to come and sing for our church again. Amen. Would you like to? Welcome again. Thank you. It's so nice to meet you personally. Amen. I want to thank God for being here once again in the house of the Lord. Yes, he worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. I used to come here when I was a little boy, still a little boy, but I thank God. <laughs> Amen. I used to come here when my Uncle Joan Scurry was alive and all us when I was growing up. But I just want to thank God for my wife upon the membership of the Vassar McKinn as our pastor in Lake Placid, Florida. The Vassar McKinn, Shadow Missionary Baptist Church in, in Lake Placid, Florida. We ain't too far from here now. We just a skip and a hop. But I just want to thank God. I thank God for my cousin, my first cousin. I thank God for him. Amen. Thank God for the pastor too. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Nice to, nice to have you with us. Amen. Yes. Florida, Miss Ane Ingram. Amen. So nice to meet you and have you with us today. Amen. Would you like to say anything? Thank you. Would you like to say anything, sir? I'm happy to be back. I used to live here. Uh, when I first moved to Florida, I moved to Cape Coral. And Lois and I are first cousins. And it's just so good to be back and see a lot of the people, those I work with, those I know, are just a community. And Amen. we just had, just had a grand time. Amen. So glad to have you. Yes, brother. Good morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lonnie Young, please stand up. Pastor, he was looking to come to church on yesterday, so I invited him to the ship. Amen. Hey, Amen. Hey, Y'all wave at him. Good to see you, brother. Thank you for coming and be a part of our church family this morning. Um, yes, ma'am. I'm practicing Operation Andrew this morning with my, uh, my niece and her husband. They told me they were coming, and so they were late, but. <laughs> but they. All up on Last time. But they're here today, so I'm glad. And then I also have uh, my goddaughter and her mother in the back. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Would you like to say something? Amen. Good morning, church. This is our family church as well. So, but to be honest with you, we didn't get to bed till about five this morning watching TV. But anyway, when I woke up, when I woke up, I thought I was already on the ship. God bless y'all. 
I'm not going to ask you which day on till 5 o'clock in the morning to keep you up all night. <laughs> Pay per view? <laughs> to all of you, welcome again to the greatest church in America. I promise you are family with us today. Uh, we ask if you have a pastor, you go back and tell your pastor we said hello from Pastor Parker and you did worship in the house of the Lord today. If not, we invite you to be part of our church family. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, go find three people, hug them and tell them God loves you and so do I. Indeed. So he said stand up and wait and shake somebody's hand. Y'all know this song by now, so get ready. 